Good morning and welcome to QOE Net OSC5 Visual Perception. Similarly to the previous OSCs, should there be any question or comment from the audience side, please post it in the chat box located on the left side of your screen. Also, today there might be some interactive questions coming from the presenter which shall be answered in the same chat box. Dear presenter, the floor is yours. Thanks, Peter. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, I'm Fatima Felisberti. I'm a lecturer here in psychology, um, specifically in cognition and neuroscience. So uh, the first part, I don't know what I'm going to be able to cover the two parts, but I just left the slides there in case you're interested in um, in the topic and I would be able to address either in questions or later on you have my email and you would be able to contact me. So the first part, it's about vision in, in general, perception in general and, and some very interesting remarks about the nature of perceiving. Uh, from Lukic, uh, seeing is deceiving Vision is a process that produces from images of the external world a description that is useful to the viewer, to, to the viewer um, our old uh, David Marr. And while part of what we perceive comes through our senses, from the objects before us, another part, and it may be the larger part, always comes out of our own mind by William James is considered to be the father of psychology and what is implicit in all these comments is that there is a part of our knowledge that sort of that it affects the way we perceive the world very very strongly and this is the the core topic of the talk today one of what we see perception is, is, is a very, we tend to, at the first sight, see perception as a, a very basic, straightforward thing. We have a stimulus from around the world, and that is stimulus is usually complex, although we are uh, visual human beings, so we rely on our vision for interaction with the world, um, and our brain processes part of the, the the new visual information is uh, takes it, it's processed by probably eighty percent of the different regions in our brain. It's extremely important. We have vision areas, but we also have areas that rely strongly on visual information. So that visual stimulus then the complex one, the visual aspects of it, sounds, smells, goes to our sensory receptors the sensory receptors then that physical information is transformed into a chemical and electrical signal and that chemical and electrical signal then is somehow processed in the brain by different areas of it integrates the knowledge we have acquired through learning or vic vicarious learning integrates it all and then we perceive things in the world there is a, a time lag between all of this that can vary anything up to 200 milliseconds in some cases but it's 20 milliseconds tends to 20 to 50 milliseconds tends to be um, a common type of delay and what is fundamental in this all is this transduction of the information so in the beginning we have sensation that is also referred to in cognitive terms as um, uh, bottom-up processing and the perception part of it that is has two components bottom-up and top-down processing uh, so sensation is the, the natural stimulus in the environment, what it provokes in our receptors. It can be uh, photoreceptors, it can be audio receptors, um, it can be touch and so on and so forth. So one of the things we see that 
it starts when a classical case of top-down processing is uh, I'm quite sure you're all aware that in our retina we have a part of our retina that it's uh, the part that all the axons from the photoreceptors and the ganglion cells and other cells or the layers they leave the retina they congregate in one part of the visual of the eye and they would leave the retina from that part when they bundle together that means that in terms of word what we see in the word that part of the retina doesn't have any photoreceptors and it's called blind spot because there is nothing there to process the word and yet none of us sees do I'm, I'm quite sure none of you are seeing uh, a black spot on both sides uh, of your eyes the word seems to be continuous and perfect and no holes onto that and and that then brings us to some of the the differences between the information that reaches our brain and the information that goes back and is transformed either in a motor uh, action or the perception of it that doesn't necessarily involve uh, activity this is the first big deception that uh, and the first big uh, problem that perception seems to solve physically our our physical detectors of the world they are not perfect and they are perfect in an evolutionary sense because we don't see those holes but they are not perfect translators or transducers of the information of from the world around us so cognitive process then in perception we have the perceptual processors we have the cognitive processors that is what is going on in in relation to top-down processing and the perceptual processors would be the bottom-up the raw information that comes and the motor processor is when we have to interact with the word we perceive we decide what to do sometimes uh, it's an automatic uh, response and then we interact with the word and what is important to remember from the very beginning is that every information we receive is processed and on its context so perception then has visual perception especially we we have to deal with lots of paradoxes the first one is that we see a word in 3d but the inputs in our retina are 2d there is no three-dimensional input or way of inputting information that is processed in the retina everything is transformed into a electrochemical signal initially um, graded potentials and and then uh, to be able to travel along the visual system electrical potentials then the other thing that is important that we have to process um, brightness and and color inputs and they have to make sense in relation to the word and we know and i uh, you probably know i expect you know that color doesn't exist in the real world color is a human um and other animals as well color is a, a re the result of um brain processing of neural processing and the visual system then has to detect changes uh, in time and also in space yeah everything is again relative to the environment we are living in and vision rather than being a, a pa passive representation of the stimulus that reach our retina is actually an active process of interpreting the world around us and that is very important we need to keep in mind I put the example of the door just to illustrate this very classical point we recognize the door as a drawing as a 2d drawing we see the door opening although we, it's just a graphic representation of that and we see depth we see 3d we see everything according to the logic of our world things that we've seen before and we just transfer that to an image so vision is actually a sequence of visual hypotheses so just to summarize it again 
the external we have the external visual information in the form of uh, the shape an object brightness color and so on and i'm just talking about visual perception of course then the eye in the eye in the retina specifically there is a transformation of this information this 3d information from the word into a transitory 2d then there is the neurotransduction and it's not electrical signals it's also chemical ones obviously then there is a brain processing where signals and knowledge are bound together and then that information is transformed into uh, a stable 3d representation of the world sorry that external information finally uh, in several um, higher areas of the, the the brain seems to be transformed into this stable 3d internal representation and then we get our impressions of reality so although we have this certain conviction that we uh, seeing the word as it is it's just an impression it's just a stable type of illusion so uh, a way of uh, it was nicely represented it very nicely the this perception cycle have uh, information available apart, uh, about an object and some information is selected we don't see all the information that comes from an object we see it but we don't process everything there is a perception then that is modulated strongly modulated by attentional um, aspects of uh, our internal state then there is a schema a schema it's a schematic a schemata it's the type of memory things we've learned about the world that we carry with us and that also influences the way we are going to perceive an object we know that even though we never seen an ex escalator for example if we had lived um, in a very isolated community when we see an escalator for the first time we are going to know that is uh, a type of staircase that allows us to go up we we have a schema of what a uh, staircase is we have internal schema of what a mug is or of a chair and although we think chairs have four uh, legs for example you can have chairs with one leg can have chairs with metal frames with four or two and one so that integrates together with the attention that we draw to the object then there is an exploration the type of we look around to see what that environment is and we then see the object in in a more full formed way an integrated way with our environment so do you believe uh, all you see just one of the first cases that uh, it's really striking do you ever notice that your eyes are moving while you're reading the information in this um, slide? Do you see? Your, do you feel your eyes moving while you're scanning, while you're reading? If I warn you, if I call your attention to that, uh, you, some of you would have the impression, oh, I know I can notice it's moving. Actually, it's not that you can notice it's moving. Uh, you just notice that you become aware that you are jumping from one letter to another one. The sensory information about how your eyes are moving, it's very hard to get, especially if it's micro saccades. When it's uh, large eye movements that you move from one corner to another one, those ones are, are easier to, to detect uh, if you become aware of it. But you... Uh, correct you just uh, notice the point I'm trying to make that we need to be uh, draw our we need to draw our attention to the movements otherwise we don't notice we are used to it we just do that uh, all the time every 200 250 milliseconds and micro saccades are even shorter and we have no idea we are doing that and and this is one of the those things in visual perception that is, is striking we have to deal with the world around us and because we have to deal with the world around us there are lots of information that is suppressed from our consciousness although it's happening there the other thing that we have the other impression that we have if you look around you now you're going to have the impression that although your eyes are moving and this is the frequency of reading we don't feel dizzy and 
even better we don't feel like the world is floating around shifting from one side to the other everything is extremely stable so there is a huge amount of movement and and coordination of movement but also a huge amount of suppression and let's say we have an image here and uh, you we're just looking at a scene in a park and then people are just laying down some are standing and reading some are just having a picnic and and and, and just laying in the sun then all these automated processes that we are not really aware of uh, that we do without thinking then suddenly they are switch on and we do become aware we need to pay attention to that and then if we notice something in the corner moving in the corner of our eyes then we make this conscious movement of our eyes because we want to see what is there right so attention as i said before the attention and the schemas that we carry that are relevant to us then uh, are triggered by usually signs of danger in the environment there are other exceptions but in general that is so visual as we saw before visual acuity is uneven across the visual field and yet we see everything sharp and focused although it, we know it's not um, uh, there we know that there is a high for view acuity and a low peripheral acuity we also know that very little detail is perceived from a whole scene at first, but we know that in a rational way. And in this case, not even if we try consciously, like with the eye movements and uh, the saccades, in this case, we cannot consciously see the word focus in the center thing, the center of our thumb uh, and, and everything around unfocus. We would have to press the, our, our eye, the ball of our eyes, we would have to use some physical tricks in, in order to do that. Uh, and, and usually, normally in, in a normal situation, we can use devices to provoke that. But even consciously, we cannot get one part of our visual field focus on something this the foveal part and see everything uh, blurred around if you are doing that if you have that then it's probably related to some eye problem okay so an artist what is really really interesting is as artists use uh, they they knew about these patterns then uh, they knew a lot about our visual system in a very in a very unconscious way they just noticed those things and even though they didn't know they may well not have known anything about the retina and certainly many didn't know about photoreceptors and anything like that because uh, the different cones they were genetically shown that, that the specific features of them were shown in uh, it's around the 60s and yet they are able to explore that and check clothes especially this big portraits with dots um, that if we just go further away, like the expressionists as well, we go Serro and others, we go further away and we see a perfect image when we come close, we just see there are dots of different colors. The other important thing about eye movements is that it was discovered by Yerbos in 68 and it comes to an integration of the information that we need. So probably, I, I don't know whether you're familiar with this painting, but it was used in, in the pioneer study by Yarbos. So look at this scene and see what you think is happening, trying to see or imagine what is happening in this scene. And then I'm going to put some questions to you. So what is the painting showing first? Then um, can you tell me the age of the family members? the rough age, then the types of clothes they, they, are worn, they are wearing. And can you estimate for how long the visitor, the stranger, had been away? So what Yerbos did, he measured the eye movements after each one of those questions. So this the, the first slide down here is the type of eye movements that we do when we're just looking at scene without any questions, just um, spontaneously looking at this painting. In the second question, 
these are the eye movements that uh, the participants made when they asked about the what the participant what the people in the uh, in the picture were wearing and here is the question about the age when they were asked about the age and there he put several other questions and these are the patterns of eye movements according to the questions that have been posed and you can see from this that our vision the way we see the world is highly directed towards our internal attention demands in in some cases and if not this is the information that we tend to gather initially uh, we tend to focus on faces and then have a general idea general look around the 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 whole thing now if i go back a bit and i ask you how many paintings there was in that scene paintings on the wall can you guess how many there were this is just to illustrate again that when i direct your attention to specific things then uh, although we have the impression that we've seen the scene, that everything was very clear, you've been looking at this for a while, we, because the questions are not directed to that, there is no specific interest, you see here in the general scanning pattern of the, some of the participants that they didn't scan specifically all the other objects because there was nothing really relevant. And there is so uh, probably you got the aspect of it now i'm going to try to use two very very short clips to show you two very important phenomena in visual perception that is called change blindness and inattentional blindness and those are also uh, very correlated to brain damage specific to v1 and v2 areas but we are not going to be talking about neurological disorders and consequences of that i just thought i'd show you what happens with us very lucky healthy individuals right let's see whether it works a case of change blindness is a, a minute or so video clip i'm not going to increase it i'm going to leave this At all. So again, the word is comprised of visual hypotheses. Visual perception is a set of visual hypotheses about the word. And Gregory, Richard Gregory, he died in two, three or four years ago. He used to go to visual conferences and he's one of the fathers of visual perception and um, illusions related to that. He used to say that we may think of sensory stimulation as providing data for hypothesis concerning the state of the sternal world but the selected hypo hypotheses following this view are perceptions so visual illusions result when the brain chooses the wrong hypothesis otherwise we have the impression that we are seeing reality so we swap from illusions to reality and that happens uh, when we are toddlers already there's this fear of a cliff when it's actually just a glass and a painted floor uh, then another um, thing that we tend to, to to imagine is that we have this mental photographs of the world that everything and uh, probably by now i convince you that we don't see anything that we think we see but there 
some really interesting case, some savage cases. And one of these cases is, is Stefan Weirard that he did. He just have a very quick view. And then from memory, he does this most amazing and precise pictures. But the majority of us don't have that ability. We just select part of the scene and have this impression that we saw it and it's all in, in one thing. Another huge, huge, huge um, illusion that we have comes from cinema. And here uh, we see, we go to the movies and we watch TV and dramas and everything related to the moving image. And we see a, a continuous movement, it's a motion illusion, continuous movement, everything is really fine. Of course, with modern technology, things are, are changing, but we see much more frames, but usually uh, just photographs presented um, with a frequency of 24 frames per minute. And here's sort of a sneeze um, from Thomas Edison lab showing each stage and a photographic stage with that. So. It's a, a very nice illustration. The other one that you may all be familiar, and let's see this what I get. Uh, this is uh, the point light uh, motion, and you, I, I don't know whether how many of you are familiar, but it's a very lovely interactive website from the BioMotion Lab, and you can transform those just dots of light in a female or a male. And they are the same points of light. It's just the small adaptations. We are interpreting the word. And this is one of the very nice cases of that because it gets vicarious learning, different types of learning about the environment. He is a heavy person and he is a very light person. Then we have somebody very nervous, just purpose driven, and somebody very relaxed. And and happy or sad is very happy and very sad and all of them change in relation to emotions and 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 other things it's just again and and i'm going to be repeating this over and over again we interpret the word according to our visions and an artist um coming back to that as well to show that it's not just a scientist artists also know about vision and about perception and use that in their work they may well not write articles about how things work they just use them to represent reality in different ways and this is from john uh, pug as a, a 3D art illusions, and they are very, very uh, convincing in some cases. After looking at this for a while, you just notice, oh, it's just a painting. But the first impression, when you look at it first, you, you really believe that that is a, a real scene. So how about uh, uh, ambiguity in, in visual scenes? So we have these ambiguities of depth. And, um, and several other ambiguities. Why do we have that? Why do we see that? Why do we trick? Well, that usually doesn't happen in nature. It's just the, our, our culture allows us to create those types of things. And our visual system has to work with information from the environment as well as it can. So, and it's very easy to be tricked because those types of situations don't happen in a normal environment. For example, other examples of uh, ambiguous images are, the, do you see the old and young woman? So to be able to see the old woman, imagine that this is the mouth and this is the nose. To see the young girl, imagine this is the profile of the girl and this is the earlobe and not the eye. Yeah? If you see that, you see the, and our perception then is going to be moving from, because it's an ambiguous image, we are going to move from the child to the, the old lady once we are aware of it. Otherwise, we may well for a while we stay in one perception, but as soon as we notice that, we start flipping from one to another one. The same case with the classical duck or uh, a hair, a har, yeah, a hair, sorry. You can see the, the hair, you can see the duck, depending on where we use, whether you see this as a beak or the ears. And you have the case where you see you either see the vase with a face behind it, or you see two faces torn apart. And then you can see a cube, depending on which color you focus on, you may well see the cube in the front or in the back.
the colors in the front as part of the front or the back of the stimulus. So, and, and together with this uh, ambiguous perception of the word comes uh, binocular rivalry. And uh, it's uh, binocular rivalry then is, is a type of perceptual rivalry um, that we also saw there are other types like the ambiguous vision. And it, it's, referred to, it's referred by different names, multi-stable, uh, vision bi-stable and so on. But what is interesting uh, about that is that when, uh, when we see those stimuli, we don't see them both at the same time. We see either one or the other one, and we flip between them, right? So there is, we see one interpretation at a time, although we can process, obviously, the, the dual information that is there. So, and the first one that we see depends sometimes the information that we carry, our internal states, and sometimes, depending on the experiment, whether it's a dominant, one information is going to be dominant, the other one is suppressed, and then they reverse sides, and then we switch. So if this image, this um, Gabor kind of a go it's not a Gabor pattern, but this um, type of Gabor pattern with the fine edges is presented to this grating, sorry, is presented to the right eye and this is to the left at the same time with uh, a specific um, instrument um, so that they both fall at the retina at the same time and not in the image like I'm showing you now, you just have to go through a strobe or some other type of um, equipment that we have, some special mirrors, then our uh, vision is not going to see a grid with vertical and horizontal lights, no, uh, lines, no, we are going to see either the pattern with the vertical grid, uh, the vertical lines, or the horizontal lines. We don't put them together. Now comes the experiment with the tube, and uh, I'm sorry if any of you know about it already. Does anybody know about the experiment with the tube? Okay, so get your tube and uh, put your the opposite. So you put the the tube in one eye, and then you get the opposite uh, hand, and it's like this lady here or this boy there. Put the hand in front of you, and I would put the thumb. Uh, instead of they are putting the thumb up away from the tube, I would turn the head and I was looking. I'm going to be looking at my the, the front of my leg, my my uh, hand, and just slide the hand along the tube from very close to my eyes to the very end of my eye. And you're trying to do that, uh, change eyes as well, and see what happens with your hand. So you are looking, one eye is looking through the tube. You can close the one eye to see through the tube. And, and then you can open the eye and see what happens to your hand. So if you had time to do that, what you're going to see is the thing that you're looking through the tube being projected into your hand. Pub trick. You can just go to the pub, have a piece of paper with you and a, some A4 sheets and get your friends to get their hands looking uh, with a hole full of beer or full of coffee. And uh, what is going to happen is the, the illusion would be stronger or weaker in one may well be weakened on one uh, with one eye stronger with another eye but their hand would always lose the the hole is going to be the the whatever you be looking is going to be projected onto your hand and if you're not having it now just practice a bit but i chose this illusion to show you because there is another benefit to that that is not related to visual perception necessarily but because we are dealing with a grant and you're probably all involved with computer sciences we spend a lot of time in front of the computer and ophthalmologists use this trick um, this type of things to alleviate tensions in our eyes and to help us to relax the eyes so so when you're looking at the screen for a long time and your eyes are a bit sore, do this um, 
put the tube in one eye, move your hand uh, back and forth about 10 times, and then switch eyes, do that again, and that is going to be, that is a very, very good exercise for visual stress and tension because it makes your eye muscles to work in in a different way you're not converging all the time so health benefits of this talk and i have to do that i was recommended to do that by my uh, and so um we're going to turn the flash then into coffee or beer. Each image then is presented, but every few seconds we switch from being conscious of that image to being unconscious of it. And you're going to notice that you may well, once you discover that, you may well focus on, on the hand and it's fine, but you're also able to look through the tube and, and see what is in that image as well. Again, by a stable image, you can see one thing or another one. And the neuro, neuro activity that is related to that, some people believe that the, the perception uh, of monocular regions and all this processing is in V1, and then the information is going to be sent to other parts of, of the visual system, and, and that illusion was mainly occurring um, in, in V1. Others then found that the effect, because it also can involve color and motion cues that would be competing with that, there are other more um, high, higher, sort of higher level visual areas working on that. And they are all integrating this information independently. Um, but the overall results are this um, competition at multiple levels of processing, whether we see the whole, the coffee or whatever projected on the hand or not. And these are the visual areas that are responsible for some of those effects in binocular rivalry in general. I just show you one very specific, small case. And I show you that case because um, it's very important it's a very, very nice thing to do when you are having a very tired eyes and you need to relax for a couple of seconds and, and to exercise. Well, enough of that. Let's see another case with color perception this time. A new question. If we had to give a color to skin, a name of a skin color, which name? So the question was posed by several people and what was more striking for many is that nobody really knew about which exact color. There is a not, uh, although it's something that we are humans and we see that and we also call naked apes because we all don't have, it's a, we are the, the, that this rare primate species that has hardly any hair, it's very located, and apart from the top of our heads, pubic areas, and uh, beards and mustaches, we have a lot of bare skin, and yet we don't have a color a skin, a name for a skin color. There are all variations, some use uh, pink, brown, uh, usually pink and brown and different shades of it or yellow depending on there is some suntan. So I'm talking about that in, in, in the realm of color perception and you know probably you know a lot about it. You know that we have three cones and that there's short, medium and long wavelengths, that they have peaks at different areas and then there is this historical belief that uh, Perhaps color vision is uh, used to detect ripe fruits and vegetables, and uh, this this theory it has been um, there are lots of evidence against it because people live in similar uh, areas with similar types of fruits. They have different diets. They don't eat necessarily the same things. Some others have a protein, a very rich protein diet. So color in that sense would not make much sense. And then I was reading a book and, and reading more recent information. That's why I decided to talk about it. One of the theories is uh, strongly related to the fact that we are naked apes and the color of our skin. So here are um, Pantone color cards so in the that meantime, try to match the skin color. Three more answers. Someone saying ranging from red to yellow, Arslan says tan and Attila Barshi says skin is very translucent. It depends very much on the lightning conditions. 
exactly. So the same skin color can vary uh, along the year, right? So there are lots of variations. And yet, and we see this as big. If you look at this, you think, oh gosh, it is really big, big differences. However, if you look at the spectrum of that in the visible range, what you're going to notice is that across all the, rage, uh, the, the races that we have, the variation and skin, the, the reflectance of light across all those schemes is very, very small. So the, although we have this impression that there's huge variation in skin color, uh, skin reflectance, in, and therefore skin color, the difference is, is tiny. And the biggest difference is between men and women, although they go in the same direction. You see that they run parallel. And that is basically because the, 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 that those measurements were taken from the skin and the belly that is not that exposed to daylight and, and pectoral skin. And the female skin then, as you saw, reflect more light than the male across the entire visible spectrum. And that seems to be related to the level of subcutaneous fat. Unfortunately, we have a much higher level of of that fat and, and translucence then would be higher, as rightly pointed by one of you. Uh, but that also doesn't explain why, uh, so let's assume that our color vision is very important for that to recognize. It's very hard to believe that we developed a, a color system that would be just to detect the color, the, the skin color of others. Because if we live in a group, we tend to perceive our skin color as the same in a, in a small group. Our ancestors would live in a small group so we have everybody belonging to the same race. So we know, for example, that we have three different color scales across the globe in these areas, and yet they have different um, um, they, they, they have been isolated and, and they have differences. So why then, if it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be very important from an ecological point of view to recognize the skin color of others, why do we have that? And then a new theory is that comes that it's very important to be able to recognize that because there is a, by having a, a color system uh, by perceiving color that is uh, a construct of the brain there is no color out there we are just interpreting reflectance as color so one of the ideas suggested by Changizi is that we are detecting in actual fact we are discriminating between oxygenation levels in the blood and the, the flow of blood, how much hemoglobin is in a skin or not. So the yellower the skin, for example, uh, the the low blood. So if you have a skin that tends to be yellow, it's like anemic uh, people, they would have a yellower skin than, than others. If there is um, a, a high excess level of blood, it's going to be bluer. Um, rather, skins would usually show a high level of oxygenation and greener skins are going to show a low level of oxygenation. And that could be, for example, good indicators of health because nutrients are also correlated with skin nutrients. So in mate selection, it may well play an enormous role, although we may well not be aware of that. And um, Shangizi developed this type of spectacles that is very important for surgeons. And there are some surgeons that could not take blood samples or things because they could not see the veins. So this type of uh, spectacles used in, uh, for clinical use, they would allow surgeons, for example, in this case, to enhance the color of the veins, so be able to detect them more easily. Uh, other ones are going to be able to indicate if there is any anomaly and so on. And depends on if they need to check the level of oxygenation or how much blood that person has. Uh, and here, just showing you uh, a healthy skin, a sort of ref uh, the fluorescence intensity and reflectance. And if you look at the second graph in B, we look the the black line is a healthy skin, the red line and when there is a basal cell carcinome, and then that changes the reflection of the skin, as well as the other diseases, it doesn't matter, there's a usually related to cancer, they change in the 
in the medium to short wavelengths change the reflectance of the skin. And it could be that not nowadays because we have all this clothing and we live in different environments, but uh, in the past our ancestors may well have used that reflectance, that skin color to uh, choose um, the mates or sort of healthy mates over unhealthy mates. Another use for that as well is uh, detecting um, emotions. So if somebody has, and what you see in this picture here is from uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science two years ago. It's a self-reported areas that people undergoing different emotions would report what they would report as being, as feeling, um, as areas of intensive reaction to that. And then you see a very red, red indicates high activation, blue lower activation. And in anger, it's the upper parts of the body. They seem to have a very increase, a much in higher level of um, oxygenation than under depression, that it's very low activity and so on. So perhaps colors in this is um, a Disney film, but it's based on some research being done. Color also indicates emotional states. So if somebody is just fuming, this is this red face apart from the expressions they are showing as well, but the color changes, then we better don't get very close because that person is very angry and may well attack us. And so uh, to summarize it, color uh, perception, instead of just seeing it as very useful to find ripe fruits in a scene or perhaps help us to identify predators in a camouflage way, in our species there is this, this second point of view that thinks, you know what, instead of that perhaps we are naked apes, uh, we evolved that way because the skin is giving us, uh, the, the changes in color of our skin are giving us a lot of information about it and before, uh, and there is also the learning in the situation, so if we live with a closely related group of people, we are going to be able to detect emotions in that. So mate choice and, and protection would play a very important role in the ability to perceive those colors. And I know I'm passing the, the time, but because I'm doing it interactive, I'm going to need probably another 10 minutes and then we finish the presentation. So sorry about that. I hope you're not completely asleep of uh, we're going to address now uh, depth perception, different perspectives on, on that as well. So the, the classical view in, in cognitive of perception and visual perception is that the, the visual system then uses cues to recover 3D information. And you had a lovely talk on, on, on depth perception before, so I'm not going to address that. I'm just getting the very um, higher cognitive processing levels of depth perception. So we can get information from the word about depth by just um, we're just using one eye, monocular view, uh, both eyes, binocular, or we can infer the movement of the eyes. So we can also have, for example, in this case, we just need one eye. We don't need two eyes to see this. We get inf depth information from height in a plane, uh, gradient texture, and shading. Um, and you see here that shading is very important. This first column, then we see this bolting outwards. The other type of information that we get um, in relation to we perceive depth by uh, convergence and divergence of our visual eyes, the muscles then they would be converging for close um, objects and converging even more for distant objects. Then there is the perspective they deal with that. And then we have the visual fields from different animals. Uh, here we have the, the, the question really is why do we have from an evolutionary perspective, why do we have the eyes uh, in front of us. Does anybody know why we need eyes in front of our, of our head? Why we could not have like uh, horses have the eyes on the side of our heads? Because if we had eyes on the side of our heads, then we would see almost, we would have almost 180 degrees view. 
then this is the cat is more centralized and you see this is sorry this is a hundred degrees roughly a hundred degree view of the world ahead of us it's very similar to ours but other animals would have a 320 degrees probably view so why why don't we why do did we evolve eyes in front of us Werner Robitza says, because we need binocular vision for hunting, <coughs> mm -hmm. while horses are fleeing animals. Exactly, they don't need to, the, the food sources are on the floor, uh, they don't need to worry too much about it, they don't need to search, scan the environment, um, and the type of prey to use, they, they move a lot and we need to scan that. And that is what we all think is the case. The problem though that we... Attila Barshi says, due to the hand-eye coordination. Exactly, that is important, exactly, I'm going to go to that. So in relation to the cat and others, the binocular vision they have, they and, and us, what we have in some animals, they don't have a, a big nose. Just with the two eyes open, can you see your noses? Okay, guys, you are lying, the ones that said yes. You cannot see your nose. What we can see, though, is that there is something there. And I can't see a nose. Nobody can see a nose. But we know it's a nose because it must be a nose. There is nothing else there. We saw our faces probably in the morning and we touch it and we know it's a nose. But we cannot see a nose. I think um, uh, it's just a semantical question. The fact is, object as it is, we cannot see a nose as a nose. But we have, if we concentrate, as you said, as some of you said, we are going to be able to see something there and even see depending on the size of the nose. Mine is big. I can see the bottom of it, sort of part of it, the very end. A kind of a, a thing that it could be my nose is very unsharp, is not something. I just can see that there is something there if I concentrate. If we don't focus on that, if we try to forget about it, we don't see the nose. We just see the world around us. But we know that the nose is there because if we cover one and please do that with me if you cover one eye and then look at your nose then I would believe when you say you can see you don't see the whole nose but we see probably you're going to be able to see half of your nose right and now you cover the other eye and you're going to see the other side unless you are lucky enough and you have a small nose and then it's not going to be that easy but I can see um, now I can believe when you say, I can see 50% of my nose, right side or left side, right? Okay, I'll so, ask to the question, there are people with long nose, can't they also see their nose? So, uh, can't they no. also see their nose? Those no, uh, not nose. if they... Only if they try to concentrate, focus, they are going to see again, it comes to the point I said before, they are not going to be able to see their nose. They're going to see something blurred, transparent, something going in, in that part of the nose if they focus and they converge, maximum convergence. They're going to see there is something there. They are not going to be able to see a nose unless they close either one eye or the other eye. And that is... And that is what uh, some people, like Shanghizi and others, uh, but mainly Mark Shanghizi calls X-ray vision. The, we are able to, we, are, we have X-ray vision, a type of X-ray. We see through our noses. We know we see our noses. In that sense, everybody before was correct, because uh, strictly speaking, and in, in a very physical way, we are seeing our noses. What we are talking when we say we don't see our noses, uh, and, and uh, we see our nose in a monocular view, but perceptually we don't see our noses because there is a suppression of that. And so we do have an X-ray, a type of X-ray, but not the classical X-ray we imagine. 
but before continuing, I would like you to read this cartoon because it just explains uh, in a very nice way the way things are happening. So if you didn't have time to finish reading, this is not that important. But here is usually what happens. This is the image we see with, uh, if we would have this image in front of us, if we would be in this place. This is the image we would see with our left eye. This is what our left eye sees. Here is the left side of the nose. Here is what the right side sees. You see there is an overlap because as you rightly know we have binocular vision and it's a very important and it's very wide in our species and this is sort of what the right eye sees and this is the perception the perceptual this is what we see as a whole we see the whole image yeah the left side and the right side of the nose this this area then is transparent and it's also important, this type of perspective is very important for video games because when you're playing video games, uh, if, would, if you have the impression you have the, in this case, it's the only image I couldn't find, I couldn't find, so sorry, I'm not into violent games, but I know lots of people like, I have two brothers that play that all the time. So, if you'd think you're playing a video game, you are the person with the gun, the gun. So, uh, you would show just, they would show just the perspective of the person with the gun and it would show shooting. However, if we would have that, lots of the scene and the context would be missed because we have this big thing. We're here already we're ignoring the nose. We are not, we are imagining that we have this transparent vision that our brains suppress that information and we don't see, we are not aware of the brain any of the nose anymore but in in this case as mentioned as you mentioned before it's important to have the eyes in front for the coordination hands and uh, of our appendages in general to hold objects but for games to be holding this object and pay attention to that would distract from the scene and we need to be attacking so what video game players do is they play around with that sometimes they are showing what the person sees the the actor uh, the active actor sees and sometimes they just go around and they show the perspective of the scene from a different point of view so it's not always in relation to that uh, it's not always the real view they had to play around otherwise it would be very hard to be able to avoid that another thing that we have x-ray why you can say you have x-ray vision and why binocularity is very important is imagine you are lay on the grass and there is a, a a lion in front of you and you're hiding from the lion but you need to know the very tall grass or small bushes so you have to see through that and uh, and not be seen so when you're looking through these bushes whatever predator is on the other side or enemy that you have uh, it would, if we would only have monocular vision it would stay very quiet and we would see just between the gaps of that um, environment if we have binocular vision each eye would show us a different view a different different holes of that and then our our brain can by tiny movements or hardly any movement at all we would be able to have a much wider view of what it lays after that, those bushes, beyond those bushes, than if we didn't have binocular view. And, and this integration of the information, all this clutter, this visual clutter, like our nose, it's going to be suppressed at later stages of processing. Did I convince you about that? The importance that we have a bit of X-ray vision? Thank you. So I was just checking for time. I think I pass a lot. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to stop here. The, the next stage, the next uh, slides are about uh, classical types of uh, theories of visual perception. And I also was planning to talk about methodologies on that, but I thought I'd rather discuss more the new perspectives in visual perception, because all this other information you can find in textbooks. And I may well uh, give uh, a talk at a later stage on methodologies uh, adopted in cognitive psychology and